Hey everyone, welcome to Sunday morning and thanks for hopping on here for a few minutes, whether it's 9 or 10.30 or 2 p.m. We're just so, so, so stoked that you're here and would carve out some time to be here with us. Listen, I've got to tell you as your worship pastor that it just stinks not having you here. I know I have an audience of one, I know that, but I miss hearing you sing. I miss seeing your hands go in the air. I miss the interaction. I miss all of it. And I just miss you. I just miss you. But I am reminded today as worshipers of Christ, Philippians gives us pretty clear instruction. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone for the Lord is at hand, right? So church family, love God, love people, love your families. Love your neighbors from six feet <laughs> because we're all in this together. Your hospitality team misses greeting you in person every Sunday so much, but we are still here to greet you at church every Sunday online. These are certainly strange days indeed, and I would just like to share with you a passage that um, has become really important to me during this time. It's in Hebrews. 10, 23 through 25. I just want to read it to you right quick. Without wavering, let us hold tightly to the hope we say we have, for God can be trusted to keep his promises. Think of ways to encourage one another to outburst of love and good deeds. Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. We are certainly not neglecting to meet. We meet every Sunday, three different times online, plus numerous times throughout the week. More than ever, community is important to us. We've got to stay connected during this time of social distancing. Please know that your church staff is thinking of you. We love you. We are praying for you throughout the week, just as we always do. We cannot wait for the day that we're all back together again. And that day will come. This will pass. But in the meantime, just remember, we're all in this together. Hello, church family. We sure do miss you, and we love you very much. And I am founding in my life during this time that one of my favorite scripture verses from all of my life, Philippians 4, 6, is really helping me. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We hope that you are faring well during this time, and we want you to know that we are praying for you, we are hoping that all is going well. God is our hope. And remember, we are all in this together. The cross is evidence that in the hands of the Redeemer, moments of apparent defeat become wonderful moments of grace and victory. I read this yesterday in my daily devotional and I loved it because it really does capture my hope and prayer for 301 women and our entire ministry during this time. It's been said a lot, but it cannot be said enough. We miss you, church family. We miss you. We cannot wait for the day that we can see your actual faces and hug your actual necks. But until that day, let me encourage you to focus on your Redeemer, put this season in His hands, and look for the victories. We love you. Hey church, we love you, we miss you. Just know that our staff is praying for, for all of you. Um, hey, my hope for you during this time is that you will rest in the sovereignty of God, knowing that from the beginning of time, all things have been under the control of his reign. He has never been anxious or worried about anything. And one day, as Revelation says, he is coming back to make all of this new. So I pray you rest in that. Uh, love your families, serve people. A lot of things in our lives may have changed and stopped, but man, God's mission surely has it. So let's press forward. We love you. We'll see you soon. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary when doing good, for in due time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up hope. Church family, I want you to know that the end is in sight, that it's coming, and that God has big plans in store, that he promised that there will be a harvest and that we will be able to reap for his kingdom. Please know that I love you and I miss you. I can't wait till we can be together again. But through all of this, we are all in this together, and God is moving and he is working. Hey, church family, Jonathan Repsiman here. Man, I miss you guys like crazy. 
I miss I miss you, my friends. I miss Sunday mornings. I miss Wednesday nights. I, I, I miss my community group. I miss connecting with so many of you on a weekly basis. You know, we've always said that the church is, is not just a building, but it's a community, a family of, of believers that come together. You know, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 puts it this way. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And certainly that is being tested right now. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to reach out, connect, and love your neighbors, your family, uh, your, your church family, your church members. We are all in this together. Man, I miss you so much, and I love you dearly. And I can't wait for us to be able to come back under one roof, connect again, where I can, can give hugs and receive hugs and high fives and handshakes. I miss you, and I love you dearly. Hi, church family. We love you. We miss you. We cannot wait to be back together for our regular programming on campus soon. But I was reminded this week that even in these tough times, we can always be grateful for something, um, but especially for the steadfast love of the Lord. Psalm 136 reminds us that God's love is always steadfast. He is never changing, and he will always take care of us. So I hope this week that you can find something to be grateful for um, as we all count our blessings as well because we're all in this together.
As we take a quick pause from what's going on in the worship center, I wanted to take just a moment to lead in our time of offering. For every single one of us, our faith is continuing to be tested. But you know, we have more reasons to trust God than we do to doubt him. We've got more victories behind us than reasons to fear in front of us. During this season, God is changing our focus. Now we will always proclaim the gospel, but the way we are doing it is different. God is blessing your efforts through Operation Community Blessing as we help our Brookstone families, many of whom have lost their jobs. Matter of fact, their response has been overwhelming. Daily, there have been families who have come and have walked away with several bags of groceries. This continues to go on and on. Our 301 Crisis Response Team has engaged in unique ways to minister to our local ministry partners. So many things have been done. Several members of our team provided gift cards to the women being helped through Justice Ministries to help them in their current predicament. You know, it is amazing to see how God continues to provide opportunities and then the resources to fund them. Thank you, church family, for pressing in and for allowing the gospel to move forward from this church to the Queen City. Will you continue to be faithful with your tithe and offering to First Baptist Charlotte? There are three simple and easy ways to give. Number one, through our website. You can go to charlottefbc.org and at the top right corner, you'll see give. It's secure and, and very simple. You can also text any amount to 84321. Or you can mail your offering to First Baptist Charlotte, P.O. Box 31046, Charlotte, North Carolina 28231. Church family, you are not alone. He has each of us in the palm of his hand. By faith we believe, with a perspective of praise, let's worship through our giving. Some the slave from 
every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and praise to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Hey, so glad you could be with us today, wherever you are, whether you're in your living room, your bedroom, your, your kitchen, your front porch, your back porch. Uh, we're glad that you're here. If this is your first time to join us for worship, we're so grateful um, that you're spending time with us this morning. I do want to ask you as we, as we continue our worship service and open God's word, if you would just take a moment, if you haven't done it yet, and like and share this post, we are having the opportunity to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out in ways that we've never have before. And so help us in doing that this morning. Also, church family, I want to thank you for your generosity over the past several weeks. Just as we have stepped off into helping needs and addressing concerns in our community, specifically with Operation Community Blessing, uh, working with our Brookstone friends, man, it has been overwhelming the support, the groceries that you've been bringing by, and want you to continue to do that as these families continue to come in and pick up schoolwork. And what a blessing it is for them to come by and see that other needs are being taken care of. Uh, through this church family. So thank you for doing that. We have more opportunities. There's some things on our website, some ways that you can serve from your neighborhood and in your community. Also some things that you can do for our ministry partners that we go deep with and help out that are reaching deep in the needs of our community. One of those things, we partner with the ministry called Beds for Kids and Beds for Kids provides beds for, for families, specifically children that don't have any. And so they've continued and resumed their operations and they're needing assistance. Uh, not volunteer hours, but they're needing sheets, bed sheets, new bed sheets. So if you think about this next, that this next week when you're at Walmart or you're at Target or whether you're on Amazon, order them some bed sheets. They would really appreciate that. You can drop that off by the church uh, anytime this week and next week, and we'll make sure that they get those. But, you know, there's a lot of great things happening in the midst of this season um, through our church and likely in your life. I, I bet that the change of pace in life is, has afforded some opportunities to experience some things that you have. A lot more family time. Uh, there's been a lot more time of just walking through the neighborhood and seeing neighbors and meeting people uh, from a distance, but meeting people in the neighborhood, getting the opportunity to hopefully minister to them. There's lots of different opportunities that are affording uh, being afforded this time, but at the same time, this change of pace is stressful. And there's no doubt this morning that as you sit there that you've had a difficult week. For some of you, and I know this is the case because we've had it come through prayer requests through other people that I and our staff has talked to, this has been a week of, of loss for you. Some of you have have been laid off and lost jobs, or you're in a sense of anxiety of not really sure what's gonna shape out and map out in the days ahead for you. And that's incredibly stressful as we've gone through this change of pace. Uh, a lot of you moms out there, you've had a change of pace. Those of you that have kids at home, this has been probably something that many of you didn't train for to prepare for to be an at-home school teacher. So that's been stressful, I know. I know that that's been something that uh, likely moms, it's been difficult for you. Um, there's lots of change in the midst. And everything has happened so rapidly. It's exhausting. It, it wears us out. We as a church have had to do that. Lots of change, lots of movement, lots of shifting, lots of hours work. It's just been a very stressful time. This morning, today, is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of a week that we remember that Jesus did something significant and incredible 
the Passion Week. And when you think about Palm Sunday, that Sunday as he came into Bethany riding on that donkey, he was at the top of the world. The disciples that were with him were at the top of the world. Everything was going great. His popularity was at a max. He was being heralded and proclaimed and, and celebrated as, as the king, as Hosanna. But that week brought rapid and swift change. In just a matter of days, this man who was heralded as Hosanna and king was hung on a cross. These disciples who were at his right hand and, and felt as if this was finally their moment, all this work, all this preparation for these years that they've been with him, finally coming to a culmination, find themselves hiding in isolation. Rapid change, but significant change. I want to take you this morning, this afternoon, to a passage of scripture that experiences a lot of rapid change. From a high moment to a moment of dilemma, a moment of worry, of panic, of, of questioning what's happening and is, are things going to work out and how are we going to move past it. It's a bizarre passage of scripture. It's one that you may be familiar with. Maybe you haven't spent much time in this book, but it's a, it's a peculiar passage of scripture in the book of Revelation chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to take them and turn them to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Uh, John, the Apostle John, wrote this book, and it was an experience that he had, a vision that he had. He was, he was stranded, isolated, put in exile on an island by himself. And in the loneliness of that moment and on that island, the Lord Jesus visited him and gave him a vision, a vision that was very specific, very unique, some strange language, lots of debate about what it all means. But it, the idea was basically a, a vision of the throne of God and the culmination of the world, the, the, the completion of God's plan, God's answers to everything, what, what everyone's wondering, how's this going to wrap up and what's going to happen. And, and so John's given this vision, this revelation of the final story of God's big story. In chapter 4, he is given a vision of the throne of God. He, he has this unique vision, this incredible experience where he gets a, a glimpse of the throne of God. And though he can't see God, he sees everything around that throne. And it's an incredible thing. I mean, to be isolated and alone and then be able to have a vision like that, to see the hope of that moment and the greatness of the throne of God and all that was around. But in, but in chapter 5, something swiftly and drastically changes the scene. And I want to take you there this morning. I want to walk through chapter 5 to see the answer to all dilemma. To our dilemma. To the world's dilemma. And specifically to the dilemma that you and I find ourselves in even now. Look with me if you would at Revelation chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 1. He says this, Then I saw the right hand of him who's seated on the throne. Now that's, that's God the Father, the right hand of him who's seated on the throne. And in that hand, there was a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break his seals, this seal? So as John is sitting there and experiencing this incredible throne moment, as he's gazing, gazing in, he sees an image of the one sitting on the throne. And in his right hand, open, laying on that hand is a scroll. And John looks closely at that scroll and he notices on that scroll there's seven seals and that scroll is full of content. He says it's, it's full within and without. He can see that this is a lot in this scroll. This is likely a large scroll and, and he can see that it's covered with content. This has a lot in it and it's sealed with seven seals. Now just a couple things about that to understand what's happening here. God the Father in his right hand, which is a sign of authority, the hand of God, the right hand of God holding a scroll. A scroll of unparalleled significance, written front and back as if it's overflowing, filled to the brim of content, sealed by seven seals. The, the number seven is, is a significant word in the book of Revelation. It's a sign of perfection and completion. And this picture is one of 
showing the, the security of the contents within that document, within that scroll. What is the scroll? Well, to look back at history and, and what the significance of scrolls were, especially in John's day and time as he's seeing this image, that Roman law documents were required to be sealed by seven witnesses of the documents. And likely titles or wills or deeds were sealed in such way, written on scrolls, much as they are today. There's a lot of signature that goes along with titles and deeds and wills. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 32, we have a, a similar image of a scroll being sealed that contains the deed. So, so what is this scroll? Well, essentially, this scroll that is held in the right hand of God is an image of the deed of the world, of the earth, of God's full plan, God's final plan and answer to everything. It contains the full account of what God in his sovereign will is determined as the destiny of the world. This is his answer to everything. This is what happens. This is all the promises and all the truth wrapped up right here. It's the, the whole plan. It's the final plan. It's God's plan and God's control. The idea of a book or scroll of this nature is not foreign to Scripture. In fact, in Psalm 139, verse 16, in your book were written all the days of my life, as yet one were formed to be, when none of them yet were. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, the vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told that, that has been told to us is true. But seal up the vision, for it refers to days many days from now. So what we have here in God's hand is, is so big. It's, it's the big moment. And for, for John, he's gazing upon it. And, and here is the answer. Every, every wonder of, of what the future holds, every wonder of, of how God works everything out, of, of God's answer to everything, it's right here in this. And, and John is, is looking on as this scroll is placed out and held in God's hand with the opportunity to see it unraveled. And to see God's plan and God's answer for everything unraveled. But in verse 3, this incredible moment, this big moment where John in this vision is, is on the top of the world. Almost ready to see God's full plan. There's a dilemma. Notice, notice the dilemma in verse, verse 3. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And so I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. You see, the opening of this scroll, the breaking of these seals, and the unraveling of the scroll opens the beginning of the end, be sharing God's plan and the the completion of God's plan. But in order for that plan to be unraveled, for everything to make sense and everything to be complete, for everything that John has hoped for, and for that matter that the people of God have hoped for, and even deeper, the world that God created has hoped for, has to be opened. And if it's not opened... It doesn't happen. Well, what wouldn't happen if it was open? Well, as we fast forward, there's a number of things that this book shares that do happen because it is open that would not happen if it wasn't open. Chapter 5, verse 9, that Jesus would not be worshipped as worthy and he wouldn't be seen as the world's redeemer. Chapter 6, verse 10, the martyrs of the faith would not be avenged. In chapter 8, verse 4 and 5, the prayers of the saints would not be answered. In chapter 9, verse 15, God's appointed plan would not come to pass. In chapter 11, verse 15, the kingdom of the world would not become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Chapter 16 and 18, the wicked would not be judged. Chapter 19 and 20, Jesus would not come back. Chapter 21 and 22, God would not reign in glory in the new heaven and the new earth. In short, if this scroll is not open, the Bible's promises don't come true. And for John, the reason he's driven to weeping at that moment 
is because all hope is lost. And what happens is the world is stuck in this vicious downward cycle. That at that moment, John, if, if this scroll is not open, this is as good as it gets. Our best days are behind us. And if it's not coronavirus, virus, then it's going to be another one. Because as the days progress, it continues to spiral down. And for the people of faith, for the people who've hoped in God, that have stood on his promises and that have believed in him, it all amounts to nothing. All the questions that we have, all the worries and all the wonders and all the whys remain unanswered. And as John looks, and as there's an examination in verse 3, no one is able to fix it. No one's worthy to open this scroll. They search heaven, and they search the earth, and they search the under, under the earth. They look high and, and low, and there's no one and nothing found. And I want you to understand something here. Looking through all of creation, there's nothing worthy. Not money, not power, not charity, not authority, not a president, not a stimulus package, not a policy. Nothing is able to open up and unravel God's ultimate plan for our lives and God's ultimate plan for this world. And so look at John. He's seen the throne. He's seen the goodness. He's seen the promise. He's seen how wonderful it is. He wants to see it come. He wants the hope. He wants the light. He wants the peace. He wants the justice. He wants to see the evil of this world come to an end like you and I do. And yet John sees all that is trapped, stuck. There's no way. You ever feel like that? You want better. You want peace. You, you want a way. You, you want something more than where you're at. You're, you're tired of the vicious cycle of this world. You look around and we see so much evil. Now sickness and worry and pandemic. We see so much difficulty happening. This is a vicious place and it just doesn't seem like there's enough justice and enough righteousness to stop it doesn't seem to be coming to an end. We doubt, we fear, we wonder, we live in a broken world and it's brokenness and the broken people that we are in that world constantly clash. Full of sin, full of shame. And what's worse is that people like me and you have, have contributed. While we try to make it better, at the same time we also all do our part to make it worse. John is weeping. And he's weeping, weeping because he can't see what's next. He can't see the way out. He can't see how to get from this and what the answer to this is. You know, the truth of the matter is, I think all of us come to moments in life that we feel the same, that we cannot see what's beyond what we're in. But the fog of the circumstances and the fog of the situation, you've, you've driven through fog. Fog is frustrating to drive. You gotta slow down because you don't know what's next. You can't see what's ahead. Or you've walked in the darkness of night. You can't see. You don't know what's ahead. And when you don't know what's ahead and we can't see what the answer is, there is anxiety and there is worry and there is panic and there is fear. There is stress. There is a sense of sometimes hopelessness in that. John is seeing that on a much bigger level, though, because he's not just seeing his personal problems. He's seeing the culmination of the world's problems. He can't see forward. The answer's not able to be brought out because the scroll can't be opened. He's gone from high to just swift change to despair and hopelessness, grief, Worry, anxiety, it says that he, he holds his head down. He weeps loudly because there's no one found worthy. But then in verse 5, someone speaks up and says this. But one of the elders said to me, hey, weep no more. Behold, 
What well, this elder is, there, there's, there's, there's 24 elders around the throne of God, and they're, they're those that are closest to him, ministering and serving and worshiping uh, him the closest. And one of these men who's guiding John through this moment says, hey, bro, stop. Whoa, time out. Hey, hey, pay attention here. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa, whoa. You, you got to check yourself, man. He says, behold, hey. Before you go down this road of despair and depression that it's all hopeless and, and that we've lost, before you let your tears become your reality of life, before you give up on everything, before you think all this is said and done, time out, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Check it, man. Have you forgotten the lion of the tribe of Judah? This is a reference to Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. Judah is a lion's club. He is crouched as a lion. Prophecy of the Messiah to come. The, the animal lion is a, a royal and dignified animal, ruling and powerful. That's the image given here. Then he also says, root of David. That's a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And he's conquered. This Messiah, this, this lion of the tribe of Judah, this root, God's promise, this king throne-like person has, has conquered. There's victory. Bro, he's won and he's able is what he's saying. Now at that moment, John is obvious. He, it's clear. He knows who he's talking about. I mean, John knew the person he's talking about very well. He spent a great deal of time, was one of the closest to him. But, but he's forgotten. Listen, John has forgotten the scope and the magnitude of that person. He's forgotten the victory of this lion, this root. And he's forgotten that, that this figure has obtained a victory that allows him the authority to take the scroll that's made him worthy to complete the plan of God, to give the world all the answers. John looks up from his tears He begins to realize something. In verse 6, it says this, In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. John looks up and while he was looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah, of the root of David as he looks and he gazes at what this elder is calling his attention to, he sees a different image. He sees a lamb, a lamb that appears to have been slain with seven horns and seven eyes. John sees a really weird looking thing. I mean, let's just admit, I mean, this is a bizarre image and and really the bizarre images continue through the story of Revelation. There's a lot of bizarre images and this is certainly a bizarre image. Uh, a sheep or a lamb with, with seven horns and seven eyes. Let's, let's think about that for a minute. Seven completion, the horns symbolize strength and power. So the image here is one of, of absolute strength, absolute power. Seven eyes. Perfect vision. And eyes speak of knowing and seeing. Perfect, absolute knowledge. This is a picture of one who has absolute power, absolute knowledge and foresight and vision of everything. And this, this figure with absolute power is, is, is at the same time a lamb. Lamb is a quiet, submissive, and humble animal. What is the purpose of a lamb? Think about it. what are lambs bred for? They're bred for, for basically one thing, slaughter. To be consumed 
by another. And this lamb has followed suit with its purpose. It says that it appears to have been slain. Don't miss that. Because it's obvious to John that this this figure, this lion of the tribe of Judah, this root of David, this, this lamb that has been slain has absolute power. I don't know if at that moment, but if it hit John, he certainly understood it as he sees the things that unfold here. But, but it reminds me of what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. When he says this, Have this mind among yourself, which is Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Don't miss What the death of Jesus has gained not just for him, but for this world. That the death of Jesus was a victory. That his sacrifice was a solution. That his demise was a crowning. What what a paradox. That the almighty king overcame all his enemies as his enemies seemingly thought they overcame him. We talk about fast, rapid change and the dilemma. The dilemma was Jesus Christ, the victor, the, these, the, men, the man these men followed was, was hanging on the cross. And this next week, we, we think through that, the, the sacrifice of Jesus and what he gave for us and the death of his on the cross. But that death means victory. And it says it here in this image. I saw a lamb as though slain, but but there's a word there that's important to note. The position of this lamb. Standing. He stands. A slain lamb stands. How's that happen? How's that happen is that slain lamb overcame the death it experienced. That slain lamb rose from the dead. And now he stands in the most impossible dilemma. No one is worthy to take the scroll and deliver God's full plan and promise. And it tells us in verse seven, look at this. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. No one could be found, no money, no power, no stimulus package, no president, no country, no authority could be found. But yet this slain lamb who stands in the midst of the world's dilemma and mankind's problem has the authority and power to take up, stand up, walk to the throne of God, reach into the hand of authority with his nail pierced hand and grab hold of the scroll and take it for himself. And at the moment he takes the scroll, hope begins. Hope is happening because the answer can now be unfolded. The why, the what's next, the the how does this work out? God's plan and purpose is now able to be accomplished because of the victory of this lamb. Reminds me of the song I heard an old, old story, how a savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a, a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. And then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He heir me, I I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory 
beneath the cleansing flood. John witnesses the answer. And those closest to the throne recognize the magnitude of the moment and this incredible worship service begins to happen. In verse eight, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down as a sign of reverence and also the same movement that they had made towards the one seated on the throne, which is significant because it shows the deity and authority of Christ, each holding a harp, which is closely associated with prophecy, meaning that this lamb has fulfilled God's promise and what he has said he would do. Golden bowls full of incense. It's a sign of prayers that through the ages God prophesied and promised redemption of the earth that it might come. And here in this moment, all is about to be answered. Elders singing a new song. The song is this, worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain. By your blood you ransomed people for God of every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on all the earth. He's worthy. He was slain. And in his slainness, in his death, he, he ransomed. He bought people for God. And a people from, from, that encompass all of humanity, every tribe, every nation, every people, every language. No matter where you are, who you are, or what you've done, or how bad you are, or how bad it looks. The victory of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on his cross is yours. He makes us a kingdom of the priests, that we have direct access to God, that we reign with him on earth, he says here. His death, followed by his resurrection, has done so much. And don't miss this, that the worth of Christ, the victory of Christ, is that he took the virus of your sin and my sin. And he took it to the cross and he died for it. That's his worth. It's found in his death because in that death, he paid the penalty as he absorbed the wrath of God for the sin of mankind. And then victoriously, beat death. And in that act and in that person, he has all authority, all power, fulfilling the plan of God for this world. The answers to all of our questions, the answers to all of our worries, the answers to all of our fears, the answers to what's next is found in the man, Jesus Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. This, this, this worship service is, just grows bigger here. In verse 11, John looked and he said, I heard around the throne the the living creatures and the elders voice, many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and, and blessing. The, the, the crescendo of this chorus as, as heaven joins in myriads, thousands, tens of thousands, unnumbered amounts worshiping this lamb who was slain and then it continues on in verse 13. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. The crescendo, every creature, everything joins in. Can you imagine this voice? Way, way, way better than our music. 
way better than our choir. This is no Southern gospel. This is no hymn. This is no praise chorus. This is no modern or classic or anything like that. This is the voice of all creation. Just as said in Psalm 69, verse 34, let heaven and earth praise him and the seas and everything that moves in them. In Psalm 150, verse six, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And that's what's happening in this moment. And this moment is concluded, this victorious moment, this answer to all dilemmas in the slain person and risen person of Jesus is concluded in verse 14. And the four living creatures said, amen. Which means, let it be. Make it happen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Listen, friend, he is the answer to what God is doing in this world. He is the answer to my problems and your problems. He is the answer to your sin and my sin. Every dilemma, every worry, every pandemic, Jesus is the answer because he is the answer to a much greater problem. Your eternity. He's the answer. He is worthy to take the scroll and finish the plan of God. And he's worthy to take your life And make it his own. If you'll surrender your life to him. He is worthy. There really is no one like Jesus Christ. And the incredible truth of who he is is that he loves you. He made you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. He's got a future and plan for your life. And he saved you from sin. If you'll believe in him, if you'll trust in him, would you do that this morning, this afternoon, wherever you're at? Would you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? All you have to do is call upon him to say, Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Be my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. I turn from my sin and I trust in you. Would you pray that prayer? Would you ask him? Would you call out to him right now this morning? It's been great worshiping with you today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your goodness that is found in Jesus, our victor, our hope, our redeemer, our slain lamb who stands our future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.